Okay, in this lecture we're going to give some examples of some mathematical models just to give an overview of what types of models exist, how the models have been used um, actually in different applications um, in industry. And so first of all I'm going to give you an overview of what we talked about last time, so the types of models that there are. We talked about um, modeling as a way to describe some kind of complex process. So here we're thinking about um, a process that changes in time. And so the terminology that we introduced last time was that we had a process X that changes as a function of time, T. So we had two different types of models. The general approaches that we were considering was a deterministic approach. So here we had just the dx dt is equal to some function, f of xt, and so this model would be built based upon whatever processes we thought were necessary to include in the model. Non-deterministic approach actually takes this deterministic approach, but here it adds some kind of non-deterministic terms. So here we get this stochasticity or randomness. Okay, so the models that we're going to talk about um, are the HIV model, how to use a model to um, design energy efficient buildings, a weather model, a VRE model, and a spider model. So for each of these, I'm just going to give an overview of the model. I'm not going to go into specifics about the model necessarily. Really what I want you to see is what the differences are. So how do you determine what is a deterministic model versus a stochastic model? This is a course in stochastic modeling, so we actually want to know what is the difference between deterministic and stochastic. So one of the key things that you're going to get out of this lecture and the, the next few lectures um, and assignment one is what does the stochastic models add that the deterministic doesn't add. Okay, so the first model we're going to talk about is HIV model. Now I'm just going to give a really brief overview of this model. I'm not going to go into the details of the model. Um, so you can actually, for every single one of the models, I have references of where you can find more information about the models. I really just want to give you an overview of like what you might see and how you might go about modeling um, something deterministically or something stochastically. Okay, so this is the schematic of the HIV virus. Um, and normally what you do is you start off with the schematic. Whenever you're trying to model something, it's kind of, it's easier to draw a picture first. And so this was a model done by Banks and others. So um, Dr. H.T. Banks at North Carolina State University. So they were modeling the HIV virus. So what they have here is um, HIV virus targets these um, T cells here, these CD4 T cells. And so what they're going to have is they're going to have active infected and uninfected T cells and resting infected and uninfected T cells. They're also going to figure out what the immune system has to do, how the immune system responds. Um, and they're going to eventually, what they eventually do is they actually use this to figure out how to actually um, administer um, some kind of therapy early on in the initial stages of the HIV virus so that hopefully you can prolong how long it takes for the HIV virus to actually turn into AIDS. Okay, so here they have this schematic and what they do is they take the schematic and then they want to actually form the mathematical equations that describe this, how this um, immune system and the T cells all interact. So this is a little bit more detailed. So it's still a schematic. We still don't have mathematical equations, but this describes how all of the different things um, interact. So again, here we have our infected activated T cells, our infected resting um, T cells, our non-infected here, infectious virus and non-infectious virus are non-infected resting and non-infected activated. And then here we have our immune system. So how does the immune system work in our favor? And so this is a little bit more detailed schematic of what the HIV model is. So from this, you actually have to do a lot <laughs> to get to these differential equations. So here again we saw our T1, our T2, our virus here, and our immune system. And there's lots of different terms that go into this. The terms come from talking to people in the medical field and figuring out how people think, how the people in the medical field, the ones who know about this disease, 
um, think that all of these interact together. And that's how you come up with the mathematical model. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the simulation, um, here you have data, so the data is in blue. And this red is if we try to fit the data um, with our model. And so here the red is fitting the data, um, fitting our model to the data. And this, the green is if we actually only use like this first part of the data. Um, and so this is the CD4 plus T cells, and here's the virus copies. And so there was data on both of these. Um, and so let me just go back one second. So here, if you're looking at your ODE system, it's complicated. It's extremely complicated. But these T1 dot, for instance, all of these dots are the change in, in whatever variable you're talking about with respect to time. Here, there's lots of parameters. So D1, for instance, is some kind of parameter that you would estimate in order to try to fit the data. Here's another parameter, another parameter. Some of the parameters vary with respect to time, but this whole right-hand side is our f of xt. Our x is all of these variables. So our x would be t1, t1 star, t2, t2 star, v1, vn, um, vi, vni, e1, and e2. So that would be all that would be contained in our x. So our x would be like a vector. And here our f would be this whole system on this right hand side. There is no additional stochasticity. So there are a bunch of parameters and it does look complicated, but there's no randomness involved in this model. Okay, so um, just to give you one other detail as to how one would use this model. So it has been used to actually inform when to give a virus, when to give um, the medicine. So what you want to do is you want to actually have, um, there's this, what's called a set point. The virus copies um, level off at what's called a set point. If this set point is low enough, then AIDS, it takes a really long time for AIDS to, um, AIDS to form. And, and lots of times the person will die of something else before they actually die of AIDS. If this set point is high, then um, AIDS comes on quickly and they're more likely to die a lot sooner. So the idea is to try to give the patients medicine in these early stages. So try to interview them here at the early stages so that the set point ends up as low as possible. And typically there are like three different levels of set points. There's a low set point, a middle set point, and a high set point. Um, and really what you want is you want the low set point because it's basically like the HIV is, is more dormant than anything and the high set point is AIDS is coming quickly um, and so they have used um, this HIV model to actually try to figure out what the best timing is to give those doses um, you don't you can't give the dose all the time you have to give um, the medicine at certain time intervals and so what's the best time intervals whether it's best to do it um, in even doses or whether it's best to randomly figure out when to put give the dose so all that's been done in future work after this model okay so another type of deterministic model so this is now a PDE model so remember PDEs is where you're going to have partial derivatives and this is the optimization of energy efficient buildings so here you have some kind of building and a building is a very complex system and so the idea is how to um, organize this building so that it's most efficient. How to organize um, where you put the vents, where you put the sensors, all of that in order to actually um, make this building as energy efficient as possible. So what is done is you can take this complicated, very complicated building and you can simplify it. So now we have a simplified problem. Here's like one room. This is a control room here. Um, and so this is like the control problem. So it's like if this is one office, where do I put the sensors so that um, the sensors will sense um, when like the air needs to be turned on or the when lights need to go on and off. Um, and so here is 
the PD system. So here I said we have these partial differential equations. Um, so partial B and a partial T. Notice here again this is very deterministic. It has no randomness involved in it. Okay, so looking at these, this system, so once you have your system here, you can actually um, go and simulate your system. So here's our system. You can put it in something like MATLAB, for instance, and you can simulate what would happen. So this is the simulation of airflow through a room. So now the question is, is where to place a sensor? So this is a, um, an idea of where you get the largest um, feedback function. So where do you get the, the best gain? So the, um, the functional gain suggests that the optimal sensor should be focused near the workspace, so here in the center. However, we all know the sensors are on the walls. And so now the question is, well, where can I put the sensor on the wall in order to gain? the high, highest gain. Okay, so just a couple more um, pictures here. So here is a sensor on top of the wall and here's a, what happens if the sensor is on the side of a wall. And so here at the top of the wall you don't see much red. The red is what we want to see. Here when it's on the side of the wall, centered on the side of the wall, you see some more red. And I guess I need to plug in. Okay. So now the best location that is found is if you actually place the sensor on the side of the wall near the vent. So here you see the most red out of the three pictures that, that were shown. And so again, this is work um, by Borgard and others. So this is work that was done at Virginia Tech University. Okay. So we've seen two deterministic models. This is another deterministic model. It is also a PDE system. Um, but here we're going to add a little bit of variability. This is not a stochastic model. We are adding variability, but again it's not a stochastic model. So weather, as we all know, there's all kinds of physical processes that go in weather. You have the temperature, you have precipitation, you have what is the wind doing. Another thing could be the chemistry of aerosol species. All of this goes into what happens with the weather. So there's a whole bunch of things in the physical process of weather. You have the heat, you have advection, you have momentum. So there's all this that kind of goes in together. So this is our PDE system for weather. It involves all of those. So here's the temperature, here's the pressure. You have all of these different variabilities. And remember, the temperature is something that varies greatly, right? The pressure is also something that will vary greatly or not so greatly from day to day. So our variability now is actually going to become in for the fact that we might not be able to measure all of these parameters. We might be able, we might need to vary these parameters um, so that they vary as what we would expect in nature. So when we incorporate uncertainty through the parameters, we get something that looks like, let's see if I can get my cursor, this right here. So this is different simulated results from the model that was on the previous slide. So here what happened was the varying parameters, um, the, the parameters were changed in the model. Um, to give ideas of what kind of uncertainty we might have in the path a storm might take. So this is might be what you might see. So this is Hurricane Katrina. So this is what you might see. Um, notice here it's, you know, you have estimated trajectory, but you have all this uncertainty about it. And the uncertainty comes from, if I take so many simulations of this, what is kind of my band here? Where do I see it going? Where do I see the track going? Okay, so this one we started to add uncertainty. We added it through the parameters and now we're going to actually look at a stochastic model. So this is a VRE model. VRE is um, a type of infection in the hospital. So it's um, a resistant infection that is found in the hospital. So this is a very simple model. Like I said, we start off lots of times with schematics. How do things um, interact? So what you have in this model is you have um, people in a hospital. So here you have uncolonized people 
people who were colonized with VRE, and people who are isolated. They are colonized, but then you um, determine that they're colonized, so you isolate them. And so what you want to do is you kind of want to reduce the spread of this, this um, resistant bacteria in the hospital. And here you have some kind of interaction between the colonized people and the uncolonized people. You have people leaving the hospital, entering the hospital. So you have a whole bunch of different factors. So this is what a truly stochastic model looks like for VRE. Notice now we don't have any um, DXDT. What you see now is you see probabilities. So the P stands for probabilities, and we're going to go through probability measures and um, distributions in the next couple of slides. But here you have probabilities. So this says, what's the probability that you will lose one, C will gain one, and J will keep the same number of people as what you had previously. So this was what it is at the time, previous time slot. So here at the previous time, you had I people that were uncolonized, J people that were colonized, and K people that were colonized but isolated. So what is the probability that in a small period of time, DT, that you'll keep K people in my J category, you add one to C, and you subtract one from U. So if you go back and look at the model, this is what it looks like. So now what we have is we have a probability of an event happening. We're not saying the event is definitely going to happen in that time period, but is it more likely for this first event to happen or is it more likely for this event to happen so this is where u gains one k loses one and j says and c stays the same so what is more likely and so there's a way to simulate this system as well and this was work done by ortez and others okay so this is simulations of the vre model so this is um, taking simulations looking at different pro um, probabilities and so there are actually several different simulations if I run the model once I'm going to get a different simulation than if I run it a second time or a third time or a fourth time these runs are called realizations this black line this solid black line here so the solid black line that you see that's what I would get if I had the deterministic model so if I ran a deterministic model that was similar in nature to this stochastic model, this black line would be what I see. The stochastic model says, I'm not going to really see this all the time. I'm going to have variability about this. So I have variability. I have vari variability in my U. Here down here I have variability in my J. So this is my variability. Notice that this is this dark one here is one time that I run it. This lighter one is the second time that I run it. So if I run this, I think this is three realizations, I'm going to get a different path each time. And they're going to somehow vary about this deterministic model, which is typically what's called the mean of the model. Okay, so the last model that we're going to talk about here, um, and I know this is a longer video than normal, but the last model we're going to talk about is a spider model. So this is truly a stochastic model. It's a stochastic differential equation. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is we're actually trying to model how a spider catches a prey in the web. So let's see if I can play this video here. So if we play the video, and I think it's a little bit hard to play, um, so what you would actually see is, and it's not running here, but if you would see a spider, and that basically the spider comes and it moves down, over here is the prey that it's trying to catch, and it moves down and it kind of moves in a kind of path to come over here and catch the prey. And so if the spider comes from here and the prey is here, is the spider going to travel in the exact same path every single time to get to the prey? And the answer is probably not. I mean, I go to the same office every single day. Do I walk in the same steps as I did the previous day? No. So, just like we don't walk in the exact same path that we um, 
Even if we're going to the same general location, we don't walk the exact same way. It may take us longer one day than another day. We may go left than when we went right the previous day. So this is truly a stochastic model. Okay, so this is a stochastic differential equation. Here it's a little bit e easier. This is our um, stochastic term. So this part here is like our dx dt equals f of xt. So this part here is our deterministic part. This part here, this is called a Wiener process. This is our um, this is our stochastic part. So this is where we add the randomness or stochasticity. And we're going to actually learn how to actually come up with these different these um, stochastic differential equations at the end of the semester. Okay, so just to give you an idea, the green is actually the true path of the spider. This blue is how the prey moves. This is the true path of the spider, and this is what our model suggests. So um, the model actually takes different paths, different realizations. It goes different ways each time to get to the prey. And so why in the world would anybody want a model for how a spider moves to the prey in a web? That's a good question, and I thought that myself. Um, notice this is work by me and others. So this is work by myself and a couple undergraduate students um, and some people from biology. So the people from biology were actually interested in um, social spiders, so more than one spider in the web, and how should the spiders spread out in order to have the most chance of capturing prey in the web. So what was actually done with this model is to actually run it to see how the spiders and the mother spider and their spiderlings um, should spread out in a web in order to be most likely to capture um, the prey. Because if they don't capture the prey, they starve, you know. So this is just the results, and I'm not going to go into the results. But um, anyway, there was a reason for actually making this model, and it was truly stochastic in nature. Okay, so in summary, this lecture was just meant to introduce you to different types of mathematical models, how they actually can be used in a variety of situations. So we go from, you know, things in a hospital, energy efficient buildings, spider models, weather, you know, all kinds of different models here. And so I kind of gave you a hint at the difference between deterministic and stochastic and how it was depicted in the different models. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next lecture.